Hello and welcome to this round 13 here of GP Sydney. On the left of our screen, that's Peter Sahurek. He's up against Huang Hao Shan. Both of these players on 9 and 2, and both of them sort of in pretty reasonable position here. Uh, Sahurek, he's chasing platinum, needs to get uh, to at least 9 7 at the PT. Um, Actually, he already got the points at uh, a GP a couple of weeks ago. He will lock up uh, platinum by attending Pro Tour Sydney. But he faces down an insolent neonate on the first turn for Huang Hao Shan. He's in the, the blue-green archetype, which you've already said that you like, uh, Frank. We'll see exactly what the extra colors are for Huang Hao Shan soon enough, because for now, he's decided that he wants to lead off as appearing to be mono-red. <laughs> well, that's uh, not what he is uh, playing. He's playing uh, blue-red. That's, uh, well, actually, the two archetypes that we just chatted about uh, in, between the, in between the round. The blue-red spells deck versus the blue-green emerge deck. Well, Fall Emissary. When it enters the battlefield, look at the top four, take a creature from it, uh, and whenever you sacrifice it for Emerge, boom, you get a 3-2. So this card is absolutely perfect for blue-green because there are plenty of blue Emerge creatures. But he got perhaps an even uh, better creature uh, from the top of his deck. Yeah, Nibblus of Frost, one of my favorite creatures in the entire format. It just seems to do a crazy amount for four mana. It's a big flyer, it's got prowess, and it manages to then ice down creatures that your opponent controls and every time you cast a spell you get to ice down more creatures you tap them they don't untap and that's the sort of effect that you don't really need to be playing too many spells for your opponent to just find themselves kind of locked out of the game but Huang Hao Shan here locked out of the game in a different kind of way just three mountains the plays thus far for him and one has to think that not having access to any islands has severely hampered what he's able to do with a hand that looks to be largely blue. Yes, indeed. That is, uh, well, the a bit unfortunate. Uh, perhaps he could have uh, taken a mulligan. Looks like his hand was uh, a bit risky. Sure, with the insolent neonate, you get to uh, see an additional card if you uh, if you like. But uh, yeah, there's always this risk of not finding the colors. Duskwatch Recruiter, a great play here for Peter Sehirek, though. If we're looking for more ways of keeping that trainer rolling, finding more creatures, then uh, the recruiter will do it interesting to see that he didn't play the nivellus there i'm guessing he's looking to get more value off it waiting till perhaps huang hao shan has a creature he's got some more mana so he can play a spell immediately uh better might also be uh, a bit worried that uh, hao shan has a bunch of removal spells in hand some red uh, burn spells that can take down the the nivellus of frost if uh, that is indeed the case then perhaps he wants to just offer up a less important creature in the duskwatch recruiter well, the recruiter transforms immediately. Still no plays from Hank Hashan. We may see that this is a very quick game indeed if it works out that mana woes prove to be a, a big problem for the Taiwanese player. That's it. Better, affectionately known as uh, Kiki in the, in the Czech uh, Republic. <laughs> He's one of the European players who has really stormed onto the scene uh, this year with a... Uh, win at uh, Grand Prix Paris earlier this uh, this season. He has been uh, performing extremely well at uh, GPs. Uh, as I said, lock will lock up uh, platinum level with uh, an attendance at the Pro Tour this next weekend. And he is a very well-respected uh, player within uh, the European circles. Tranyard explores the play for Petr Sehirek and sees just a Thermo Alchemist from Huang Hao Shan. That unlikely to slow down his offense too much. I mean, yes, it can block the Dranyard Explorers, but there's plenty going on for Zahurek here. Well, at least there's a Thermo Alchemist that's uh, a nice part of the blue-red game plan of uh, pinging the opponent a little bit and then... Uh, well, whenever you play an Insular Sorcery, it gets to untap for additional pings. But at this point, uh, Hao Shan is uh, way behind. He will uh, probably have to draw an island on the next turn or perhaps the turn after that. Otherwise, I'm sure that uh, Better will be able to uh, add to his board, uh, especially with uh, the cost reduction from his uh, transformed werewolf. And there we have the Nibblus of uh, Frost that we already saw with the Fall Emissary coming down. Yeah, Thermo Alchemist, assuming that you have a draw where you are casting a few spells here and there, you are kind of in the game, is one of the cards that's gone up in my estimation the most since starting drafting with 
Eldritch Moon. It's one of those cards that, because of where it sits on the mana curve, if nothing else, it can quite happily block. It comes down nice and early. Two isn't necessarily the busiest of mana costs for many of these spell decks, and it generates a crazy amount of damage over the course of a game. Mm. Interestingly, such a reg chose not to uh, sacrifice his clue at the end of uh, Haoshan's turn. Perhaps this may signal that uh, such a reg has an, uh, an instant in hand, for example a pump spell, that he always wants to uh, keep open, keep the mana available in case of uh, some red burn spell. And I guess that any instant would represent a way of pumping his Nibblis of Frost to mm -hmm. get it out of Fiery Temper. So yep. the range of things that could represent a pump spell, about as large as it could be. So Hurek now, though, just sort of figuring out exactly what to do. It looks like he's taken a step away from the table. He might just be conferring with a judge here, trying to just confirm exactly how one of his cards is going to interact with another. Does not want to fall afoul of just having misunderstood the rules on a particular play. Yeah, Eldritch Moon is a new set, of course. For many of the players here in the Grand Prix, this uh, may be, uh, well, for some it is the first draft of this uh, Eldritch Moon format that they have uh, done. For others, perhaps not the first draft, but they're still sometimes <laughs> learning what, uh, what certain cards uh, do. It's uh, just uh, the nature of uh, playing with uh, these new cards. Even, even the best players have been, uh, for example, discovering that, uh, hey, back with Survivalist, when you have Delirium, it gains Trample. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, pro players from team uh, face to face here. So, <laughs> you know, ev even the best players, even after doing uh, several drafts, they may not have uh, gotten like all the text on the cards in their heads yet. So, if uh, you at home make uh, these kinds of uh, mistakes, well, just shrug it off. It happens, but it happens even to the best players uh, here at the Grand Prix as well. It's the Horrid Swarm briefly hitting the battlefield, uh, but ultimately not hanging around for too long. Huang Hashan, he has not really had to reveal a great deal of his deck here. Uh, unfortunately, the reason for that being that he simply didn't draw very many lands of his second color. And it'll be interesting to see how Petr Sohrek chooses to sideboard here, if he sideboards much at all. It will ultimately come down to whether or not he maybe got a feel for what colors Huang Hashan was in, just based mm. on how the draft went, or anything that he might have seen from where he was sat in other games. Meanwhile, though, we're going to move across to see uh, William Craddock against Ben Stark. Both these players on 10 and 1, and we've got a busy board going on here. Uh, ben Stark on black-white, while well, there's red-green for Craddock. A couple, uh, he's got two copies of Gloom Widow there, which are fairly good against the spirits that Ben Stark has in play. But with such a wide board, it may be that Ben can start turning a corner, currently down on life, but potentially able to slide around that. Yeah, one of the more important cards on the battlefield here is the Hanwer Militia Captain. It's the transformed creature that uh, Ben Stark has. It has well, a power and toughness equal to the number of creatures on the battlefield. And every turn at the end of uh, your turn, you get another 1-1 one, one token. If, yeah. uh, if left alone for too long, well, that will just uh, provide an insurmountable board state. But it is just uh, the live Lugan match, so we're uh, we will be switching over to our main match between Petr Sacharek and Huang Haoshan when they start again. But it is nice to uh, get a view of these uh, these board states. It uh, goes to show that there is plenty of play going on in this format. Yeah. Now, when when you're Ben Stark at this point, well, you could just sit back, just get a token every turn, perhaps uh, attack with the Steadfast Cathar, which is also boosted uh, by the number of uh, creatures he has on the battlefield. Get some hits in. Well, either William will have to take a bunch of damage or line up an unfavorable trade. And, well, Ben still has plenty of creatures back to uh, defend with, so he is in no danger of dying to uh, any attacks yet. Another token at the end of the turn. Yeah, it looks like William just does not have a good way to uh, to break through. No way to deal with the, the biggest creatures on uh, Ben Stark's side of the board. No evasion to uh, to attack past it. He'll just have to, uh, well, sit back and pass the turn again. Yeah, Hope Against Hope proving very, very large indeed here. Two different creatures with Hope Against Hope on them. Plus that Hanwe cult, uh, yeah, the cult leader there. All three of them benefiting from just how many creatures Ben Stark has on the board. And 
when we have a very, very large creature on the board, sometimes we refer to it as the Abyss. Uh, the <laughs> Abyss, a card from Legends that means that you have to sacrifice a creature each turn. And when you have creatures so substantial on the battlefield, they basically force a block every single turn. And we see William Craddock here, now on three life, basically forced into action each and every turn just in order to try and find a way of staying alive. Well, this is a good way. Malevolent Whispers, madnessed out at instant speed thanks to the news constrictor. So this could allow him to take one of Ben Stark's attackers, Antabit, use it to block another uh, attacker. And if the power and toughness lines up uh, correctly, which it may not, uh, he might be able to uh, kill two of Ben Stark's uh, big creatures with that one Malevolent Whispers. Some things to note here, the power and toughness of this creature is now, well, it's uh, back to 6-6 six, six because William is controlling it and William has six creatures on the battlefield. The Steadfast Qatar, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight creatures on Ben Stark's side of the battlefield. So that one currently is, well, too big. 10, 11, I, uh, I believe. I mean, the Malevolent whispers, whispers itself represents uh, a little bit of a change in power and toughness as oh well. Oh yeah, it gives plus two power, so that means that the, uh, the Handworm Militia Captain, the, the transformed creature, is eight power. Still not good enough to uh, take down the, the Steadfast Qatar, but at least William was able to, uh, well, get rid of it and jump block in the process, keeping uh, himself alive for another turn. Yeah, those Gloom Widows, great in the face of spirits, not so good when the big scary creatures are on the ground because they can only block creatures with flying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and after all of that effort, Ben just, yep, Midnight Scavengers, get get it back, play it again. And this, this looks to be like a bit of a desperation attack, a last ditch effort, but might as well try. Maybe with a pump spell and an uncaged fury, William can put together nine damage, but looks like he does not have yeah. access to that. Ben Stark taking game one there in this round 13 match. Both players at 10 and 1, and we have not missed a single moment of our main <laughs> match, that being Peter Suhurek against Huang Hao Shan. They're just finishing shuffling up, and Huang Hao Shan desperately hoping to find a way of getting the damage that he needs in to square this one up, because game one, well, he basically just drew mountains, and mountains not good enough for his red blue deck. Yeah, I have a uh, deck list in front of me, so to give an indication of what you might expect. Assuming that uh, he finds a nice assortment of islands and mountains. His uh, deck contains several uh, copies of Ingenious Scarp. That is the 2-3 Prowess uh, for 3 mana. Uh, 3 copies of Drag Under. So Lovely. if he is able to uh, get uh, an early board advantage, that Drag Under for 3 mana bounce any creature, well, usually an opposing one, mm -hmm. uh, and drawing a card, perhaps triggering the Prowess on Ingenious Scarp in the process. That is what his deck is uh, set up to do. Also two copies of Just the Wind, uh, which can just bounce an opposing uh, permanent. So when uh, Haoshan gets ahead on board, he will be able to uh, put some tempo spells to good use. Well, on the play, he did have a mulligan, but has started things off much better than in, in game one. Turn two Thermo Alchemist, and he has both islands and mountains. Has to look on as Duskwatch Recruiter comes down for Petr Sahurek, but at least this time round, we're gonna hopefully see a few more spells from Huang Haoshan. Well, there's mana troubles once again. No third land for uh, for Haoshan. Oh no. Not like this. I, and even if he has to pass the turn, I'm not sure if he uh, is able to play so. No, it looks like he is. He might even have to uh, transform the Duskwatch Recruiter. But given that he's stepping the Thermo Alchemist in his main phase, there is almost certainly an instant or sorcery coming up. Uh, just the wind. So that will bounce the Duskwatch Recruiter. Eh, it doesn't really get him ahead on board much. Just to win this is the type of card that uh, you would love to play either on, say, a 5 mana or 6 mana creature so that you get some, uh, some tempo advantage or to uh, clear the way for your attacker so that you're able to uh, get in for some damage. Not really to just bounce a 2 drop on turn 3, but it's just uh, the best that Haoshan had available given the low amount of lands that he has drawn so far. Foul Emissary, the play for Petr Zhorek. He has plenty of ways of making sure that he filters his draws on the top of his deck, finds creatures. He, so looking at the top four here, looking for any creature that he's going to reveal and put into his hand. And second verse, same as the first for him, reveals Nibblis of Frost, that going into his hand. It's one of those things that, does he want his opponent to know it's in his hand? Probably not really, 
but he's certainly not going to ship it to the bottom of his deck, which is the alternative when it comes to Falamus. Oh no, he'll he'll be happy to uh, pick this one up. And it looks like an island there, the draw for Huang Hao Shan. So All right, we have a game. Yeah, very happy about this. Let's see what he can do with this extra mana. Ingenious Scab being lined up to the front of his hand. Yeah, that is uh, one of the better tree drops that his deck has uh, access to. So now every spell that Huang Hao Shan casts represents one extra damage from the Thermo Alchemist, but also potentially one extra damage from the uh, Ingenious Scab. And actually, because it has the ability to pump its power at the cost of its toughness, prowess sometimes being even more valuable because it means you can simply punch, pump the scab even further. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is perfect. This is exactly what uh, Blue Green is trying to do. It of the Horde Swarm, also known as, well, it, uh, <laughs> being uh, emerged out here on turn four. That's the perfect curve. Three drop into uh, a turn four emerge creature. And even better, he was able to sacrifice the Fall Emissary, which gives a tree to Eldrazi whenever you sacrifice it for Emerge. Yeah, yeah look at that board. He cast one creature. Somehow he's ended up, in spite of having sacrificed a creature, with four creatures in play, and each and every one of them valuable. The insects, yes, they're going to bounce against the Thermo Alchemist to mm. some extent, but even if they just end up blocking Ingenious Scab, this is a bit of a problem for Hang Hao Shan. He added eight power to the board on turn four. That is an insane raid. Nine power to the board. Well, well, I, well, I, I there was already one power from the yeah, 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 yeah. So drag under being used on the Eldrazi, si Eldrazi token. So that meaning that at least it's a removal spell plus draw a card, mm -hmm. plus, plus prowess, ping a damage. Plus ping. Yep. Yeah, prowess not being valuable enough because the three four scab cannot attack into the four four eight of the horde swarm. But yeah, if you are wondering what these two uh, archetypes are trying to do in uh, the new uh, limited format. Well, here's your example. Blue-red, focus on the spells. Blue-green, go turn three uh, creature that gives some value when sacrificed into a turn four emerge creature. That is what uh, both of these decks are trying to set up. Now, Sakturak still ahead by a little bit, if only because he, uh, he will be able to play his fifth land, whereas Haoshan still behind on, uh, on mana. But uh, the game, may still uh, turn out to be quite close and Sakurak may have to uh, well worry about his life total sooner rather than later due to that uh, Thermo Alchemist. The damage will add up. And I guess that at least in principle the red-blue deck is well positioned against an emerge build because bouncing emerge creatures frequently is very powerful. Wolfkin Bond we see there. Uh, putting it on uh, a 1-1 one -one token to turn it into a 3-3 three -three just so that he is uh, able to present another relevant attacker into uh, both of Haoshan's three toughness blockers. That's seven damage coming across. And also the Wolfkin Bond brings a uh, free 2-2 two -two Wolf uh, with it. That 2-2 two -two Wolf not too uh, relevant against all of these three toughness blockers, but oh well, hey. Yeah, not you're, you're, you're not going to say no to it. You're not going to say no to a free Wolf. No. Well, to be fair, if someone would just in real life offer me a free Wolf, not sure I would uh, like to have a wolf as a pet. Seems like a tough animal to uh, to handle. Yeah, I would imagine so, but I think you need to be careful about someone that's bringing a wolf around with them and not just say no to them. Maybe <laughs> find, a, find a slightly more nuanced excuse. <laughs> Fair enough. So, Haoshan finding his fourth land, potentially getting a bit of action going here. Let's see what he's going to do with this extra mana. Well, at this point, Haoshan is, is behind in the race and on board. But Mercurial Geist, this is uh, the, the blue-red signpost uncommon. Just a 1-3 flyer, but whenever you play an instant or sorcery, it will get a huge boost, plus 3, plus 0. So if Haoshan is interested in uh, entering some kind of damage race, well, this is the card that may allow him to get ahead. Imagine Haoshan, for instance, on the next turn. I haven't seen his hand yet, but just looking at his deck list place a land drag under just the wind that's a lot of flying damage coming in some extra pings with the thermal alchemist time gains thanks to these uh, bounce spells so that is uh, certainly something that this deck is uh, is capable of i mean imagine if he plays land borrowed malevolence uncaged fury would also be uh, quite, that would, that quite, would be quite good well yeah yeah uncaged fury on the mercurial geists i've seen it done it was not pretty 
Yep, there are a lot of powerful spells in uh, the blue and red colors. And the, even though Sachurek is sitting at 15 life, these kinds of uh, options will be going through his mind as uh, risks to uh, be taken into consideration. Nebelgast Herald, a great pick up there for Sahurek. We know that he's got another spirit in hand, so in future turns he's going to be able to tap down more creatures, but in the meantime he's going to get stuck in with the rest of the team here. Uh, aggressive. Well, the, the obvious blocks are the 2-2 the two -two on the O tree and the 1-1 one -one on the 1 tree, so that uh, how Sean would uh, take 7 damage and basically eat the 1-1 one -one attacker for free. Um, given that, it is somewhat surprising that Sakharek actually attacked with the 1-1 one -one and the 2-2. Two -two. They don't really seem to be presenting relevant attackers in the face of the 3 toughness blockers. But because he is attacking with them, he's also representing some kind of pump spell, like for example uh, Aim High, and Haoshan will have to take that into consideration when making his blocks at this point. Well, it looks like you called it there. Aim High was the choice, and that means that Mercurial Geist not going to get to hang around. Mm -hmm. And Haoshan also taking a pretty sizable chunk of life lost there. Yeah, perhaps Haoshan... Uh uh, could have read Sakharek for that aim high, but even if Haoshan believes that uh, Sakharek has it in hand, well, Sakharek is so far ahead in the damage race that Haoshan can't really play around these pump spells. He just has to make the, the blocks in order to stay alive and then hope that, uh, well, it eventually works out or that perhaps it was a bluff after all. So I like the attack and I like the block. But on six life now, next turn is going to be crunch time for Huang Hashan. Yep. Yeah, this is uh, this is going to be tough. He's facing a lot of uh, power on the other side of the battlefield. And he knows about the uh, Nibblis of Frost that oh got yeah, revealed that, uh, at the start of the game as yep. well. It's going to interact very nicely with the Naval Ghast Herald already in play. Mm. Yeah, I saw some uh, Vilden Pack outcasts in Hashan's hand. The 4-4 four four for 5 mana, not exactly what he needs, especially when he only has 4 lands on the battlefield. But just passing the turn with uh, lots of mana up, well, Zacharek may have to worry about all kinds of things, tricks like uh, Borrowed Hostility, uh, Blue Bounce spells. But Haoshan's at 6 life. If you attack with all of your creatures, there's nothing really, truly terrible that can, uh, that can happen. Even if there is, say, this, this Borrowed Hostility, uh, for instance, well... Maybe you lose two creatures uh, in the process, but you just uh, but you still put Haoshan down to a low life total in the process. And, well, if Haoshan has nothing and you attack with everything, perhaps you may just win on this attack. Especially if uh, Sakharek is able to uh, possibly tap down something with the Nibblers of Frost. Well, that's going to get uh, countered. Yeah. <laughs> Con convolute coming with an extra point of damage, thanks for Thermo Alkalist. And just not quite enough mana there to be able to play around Convolute. No, but it does turn the Ingenious Cop into a 3-4, so that makes uh, attacking a little more difficult. That said, if you attack with everything, then the 3-4 will probably block the 3-3. Three three. The O3 will probably jump block the 4-4. Four four. Yeah, that's that's still a fine attack to uh, to make. If it lines up like that, then you effectively trade uh, your 3-3 three three for an opposing uh, O3. And, well, you put Haoshan down to 2-life. Uh, to Haoshan would like to keep both of his creatures uh, around, but he has to block it of the uh, Horrid Swarm uh, in order to uh, stay alive here. Oh, there's even 5 damage. He falls down to 1. Final parting gift from Thermo Alchemist. One last ping. <laughs> it has done all of the damage for Huang Haoshan here. Alright, so now maybe Rush of Adrenaline, Uncaged Fury. I don't think it will add up to enough damage, and I don't think Haoshan has either of these cards in hand. We'll get the life totals updated uh, quickly for you, but I believe Haoshan is now currently sitting at one life, which means he's facing five lethal attackers. That is going to be tough. Yeah, those insects that we said didn't look super relevant earlier on, each of <laughs> them now representing entirety of ha Huang Haoshan's life total. And Petr Sahurek has to be feeling pretty good about his board position here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ultimately it seemed to be uh, a game of mana troubles. Well, if I'm uh, Sahurek here, 
I would just make uh, make the block. I'm not sure what this uh, attack signifies exactly, but I'd rather be uh, be safe than sorry. That said, even if there is an uncaged fury, and say uh, say a pump, that uh, would not mean it's lethal yet. Then again, might as well play it uh, somewhat safe to make sure you don't die to some kind of combination of uh, pump spells that you hadn't thought of. Oh, oh wow, there was an uncaged fury in hand for Huang Haoshan. If the Mercurial Geist had hung around, maybe that might have been good enough. As things were, Huang Haoshan did have to protect his life total, wasn't able to get everything that he needed going there. So he does take a bitter loss. The third loss is always the one that really stings at these GPs because that's kind of the point where you go from, yes, I might be able to string something together here. Top eight could still be uh, in my potential future to, well, I need to really cross my fingers and hope that tiebreakers play out for me. Uh, mm. In these bigger fields, sometimes even then it does not work out. So Petr Sehorek, little little smile on his face, and rightly so, because he advances to 10 and 2 here um, in round 13. So that is the end of this round. We can see these players just sort of making sure they de uh, they um, root their sleeves, because there's going to be another draft soon enough. But here from the end of this round, I'm Tim Willoughby, this is Frank Carsten, and we'll be seeing you again soon.